Change for the paper. No patience for silence. I tried to cut Corporal Steel into the gun. Oh, it's just watched him blow. Ten million lions up. To repair! Hi, I'm Jeremy Rouse. I'm Matt Richards. We're sitting outside the Opportunity Shop. Uh, enjoy uh, what we're about to show you. Um, this is the last time you'll see us, so... <laughs> it was shot on Super 8, so don't expect uh, anything too glossy. It's anyway. a little rough around the edges. Rough around the edges, yeah. Just to leave a document behind, just to leave a snapshot or a glimpse into a, a period of time. And this is not a music documentary, really. It's a, it's, it's a document. It just so happened that there was lots of bands that we liked playing frequently. There was at a stage where we were both really kind of discovering Melbourne music. I think the two of us were out at least three nights a week just going to shows. Quite a few bands from other cities and stuff moving to Melbourne as well. So there was this kind of influx. The quality of the music coming out, if you found the good stuff, was high enough that you were kind of like, whoa, you know. First one was Cold It's Glider. Oh, not as part of the diaries though. The one, the first time we shot them, we haven't used that footage no. as part of the diaries. We have it though, and it's awesome. But we actually just tested, didn't we? We tested. Yeah. It's a really interesting music musical style. At the time, we thought it was really qu quite quite unique and um, quite technical, but at the same time, it had kind of feel, improvised feeling. And First time we saw him, Pony, and we're both standing there, and it's just like, holy shit! Lyndon, fucking yelping. He spun around. He's leaned over backwards he, he and yelled into yeah. his microphone behind his head. And, and we started, and it was funny. We used to love it when he used to sing, but he didn't used to sing at every gig. And then all of a sudden, if he'd let out a couple of guttural screams, and yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, cool. He's, he's, he's saying. He never had any lyrics. He was just like free, like from like jazz style. Sometimes or whatever. he was into it. Sometimes he wasn't. Probably the favourite show was that 101 show for me anyway, because it was totally packed. 
camera in one hand, long neck in the other. Long, long neck and rollies on top of the amp. Yeah, it was the first time we did it. That was my disco. Just for a love and cold, it's and love diagrams. Got a head start with three bands in one night. Yeah. We just like shot the first few and thought, if we're going to spend this much money, we should try and make something out of it. I don't know how the number twelve came up. Uh, well, eight would be too little. Ten would still be kind of too normal. <laughs> if you look at the Super 8 Diaries, it'd be like if you were running a record label. We'd probably put out the records if we had the money and we had the label for all the bands that we had on it. They had to be real. No concept jockeys. <laughs> no hair product. <laughs> I guess I mean, fundamentally the, the bands probably needed to be independent. The, the bands create the music for themselves primarily. We wanted to document rock music. I think that's I think that's true also. It had to motivate you in some way. Yeah, it's like we'd go and see a band, we'd see them once, twice, whatever, and then it was, it was just a matter of say, do you want to shoot these guys? And I said, yeah. That's pretty much the selection criteria. <laughs> <laughs> when your leg starts shaking at a show while you're watching and it's a kind of involuntary shake and there's it's something exciting being thrust through the air at you. Actually, originally just going to be just music, and then we decided it might be more interesting for the viewer to enjoy an interview. To give a little bit of an insight into just some of the the characters that have made up what we consider interesting in the independent music scene. Well, I think you just do what you do, and you do what feels right, and you do what you like. And if you start putting limitations on yourself, it's not much point playing music. It's kind of enlightening, you know, just to let people in your band be what they are. Yeah. You know, and then try and um, embellish it, you know, and, and add to it. Vocals were off. They know how to, they're, got, they're there to have a good time. They don't care what the fuck's going on. They're just like, right, party. Oh, yeah. What's this? Oh, it's a bit weird. Oh, no, it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mikey writes backwards riffs. Yeah, uh, it does sound backwards. We go, hang on, nah, it should be there. And Mikey goes, nah, if you listen to it this way, it goes there. And, and then you got Brad trying to explain to Danny exactly where it's sort of going backwards. Even though the feel right until later on down the track you go, oh, yeah, it makes perfect sense in here. Yeah. But no, but I mean, I'm from a small town in the South Island of New Zealand. It's like, we're totally the opposite of Washington, D.C. It's like, there is nothing in common. Yeah, absolutely nothing in common like, with that place <laughs> and that place. You, you can only identify where you're from. And if you try to be something else, you're going to fail. So we're writing it like, if we're happy with it, then, then that's a good song. We don't think like, oh, I wonder if people would like this bit. We're never going to play with bands that we don't like just because it would be good for our career to do that. Well, all the bands could all actually play, even if the music was obno wow. obnoxious. Yeah, that's true. Like, uh, they could all technically have some degree of technical ability. I just sort of find something boring about writing songs in 4-4. We just sort of took this approach and said, we'll play that, that pattern 13 times, and this one 3, and so these prime numbers. We try work with numbers we know, like phone numbers and things. Yeah, yeah. So we don't forget shit. <laughs>
What are your thoughts on uh, Australian Idol? It's shit. Yeah. I know it's probably in, it's in its third season. I think it's pretty funny. It doesn't have much relevance to our world. I mean, I people get really upset about it, but I think it's really much different than... I think it's a long history of that kind of manufactured pop music. Mm. It's not selling music to musicians or, you know, music lovers. I think it's just selling it to a mass market. People often assume that there's this weird binary opposition where it's either a band makes it or they fail. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I don't really, know, I don't yeah. really think that's the case. Like, you know, if you if you play music to just make it, then fuck off. You're doing it for the wrong reason. You know, I mean, we like sort of the absolute antithesis of that. Like, there's no fucking urge to be famous. If I wasn't playing in a band, I wouldn't be working more. I'd still be on the dole. <laughs> you know, it's not a sacrifice. What's up? Personal level of success? I'm pretty sweet, eh? <laughs> I'm pretty alright. When I was like 14, I wanted, wanted to be in a band. Now I'm in a band. And I wanted to be out of New Zealand. Now I'm out of New Zealand. It's taken a while to complete. Uh, fuck ups, money. Not just money to actually pay for things and process things and stuff like that, but in doing it, you need you need to do all those other things, daily things. You need to work. You need to pay rent. You need to do all that sort of stuff. It's not like we're given a grant and we could just go, hey, there's a gig, there's a gig, there's a gig. You know, like line it all up. up. And we never planned it. And sometimes we didn't shoot at the band for six months. Didn't anything, see anything that we wanted to do. When we decided we were going to make something out of it, realistically, we probably thought, oh, we'd be all done in like a year and a half. <laughs> yeah, we, we, <laughs> we were fairly ambitious with our finish date four <laughs> years ago. As well, you, you look at people that go to gigs and stuff. And a lot of young kids only go to shows for like four years or whatever. So you're dealing with a whole other influx of kids yeah. and stuff that's going on now, and I think if we sat on it any longer, it would become less relevant. It's good to get it into the minds of the people that were around for that time, and then they can pass the knowledge on to the next lot of people that are coming.
say hello, Danny, introduce yourself. No way. You introduce me. No, you have to. <laughs> this is Danny the drummer. Yeah, Danny the drummer. <laughs> I'm Brendan. My name's Mikey, and I play guitar and the odd keyboard. Rob Solid, not by bass. Eddie, Eddie Current. Oh yeah, that's my name. Yeah. What's the What's the deal with the names? Is that the old rock and roll tradition of inventing? Nah, it was. I think because we thought we were just going to put that one seven inch out and disappear in an obscurity that we didn't really think <laughs> that hard about having names. I like it because it separates you from just being Brendan. To Brennan suppression. Yeah, I didn't even really know what the word meant when we first said <laughs> it. I, I like um, I like the gloves. They keep me. They sort of separate me from uh, Brendan to Brendan suppression. It's sort of a bit of a security blanket. Yeah, there's been a couple of times I've forgotten them or, you know, just forgot to put them on or something. But um, his powers weren't as yeah, strong. Yeah, weren't as strong. <laughs> oh, Daddy's my brother. Who's in there? Concentrating. Brothers are usually in bed with my brother when. I was a kid, and then I was in a band with Brad and Danny, then I was in a band with Brad, then I was in a band with Danny. Years later, Danny met Brennan through some something else, like, you know, painting Art and stuff. stuff yeah. And, um, yeah, this was the only sort of thing that, you know, worked, I guess. Through hanging out with Danny, I, I hung out a fair bit with Mikey, and then Mikey got me a job at, um, at the record pressing plant. One drunken jam later. We did that drunken jam and came up with that so many things. And then um, a couple of weeks later, in in uh, 2004 January, um, we got together and did Which Get Up Morning and You Don't Care. And I think we sort of started playing 2000. regularly like two years ago. Yeah. It just fell together. We know each other's styles. and I'd say most of the time I come with either a sort of a song's worth of riffs, or just a riff, and Brennan usually writes books worth of lyrics, so he'll just figure out what... Switch through, see what... Or like either I'll have it in my head of like a song idea. Or he'll ring me up and leave a message on my answer machine and says, Could, Can you write a song that sounds like a thunderstorm in April? <laughs> yeah, usually like a or, mood. I've got this. Do, 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 do. <laughs> he never uses them. <laughs> this is where they get to the point where you, you tr uh, one of you will come up with something and you're just like, no, nah, that's, that's shit, man, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah Danny's, usually, Danny's pretty good at shooting those down. Yeah, da Danny doesn't really, but he's probably a bit too good, he's like... It's, it's honest, it's an honesty that I think you can probably mm. only have with your brother. Sometimes you could probably work on something for a bit longer and... Or there's been times yeah. where, where Danny said, I don't like it, and then we've stuck with it and then he ends up loving it. Yeah. Well, Mikey mm. writes backwards riffs. Yeah. You know, to what you usually would be. That's my idea. Yeah. It does sound backwards. You go, hang on, nah, it should be there, but Mikey goes, nah, if you listen to it this way, it goes there. And, and then you got Brad trying to explain to Danny exactly where it's sort of going backwards. Even and, though it doesn't feel right until later on down the track, you go, oh, it makes perfect sense in there. Yeah. Usually I kind of I un understand the backwardsness more than the forwardsness, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we never have a set list, so we just play what we feel like. Um, yeah. It's not like a thing like, let's not have a set list, but it's like, well, you know, we sort of end up being there, and we're like, oh shit, we don't have a set list. That was the first sort of, why well, yeah, it sort yeah. of first happened, and it was like, oh, and it ended up being a lot easier, sort of like going with the flow of how we were feeling, you know, and how well, it was we, all going. Well, you can sort of like read what, what like, feels like. Yeah, something. what the crowd sort of likes it and what sort of song you need to play at that sort of time to maybe make the night better. I think we're pretty brave when it comes to this song, but we might not quite have a handle on it, but say, mm. yeah, no, let's do it this week. You know, we're playing it, practicing it now, let's do it on Saturday. And you're like, oh, geez. Yeah, the fact that you should scare the player, or, you know, it might all fall apart probably makes it sound some, better. Some of our songs probably have crashed and burned yeah. due to that. But I think the type yeah, of music we play, like, um, work. it sort of suits, yeah. yeah. <laughs> suits crashing and burning. Like yeah. That. Yeah, mum, yeah. mum's come Your a few friends, times. Yeah, mum, mum and dad, went, they came to the album watch. Dad, yeah. dad came once and he, he stood outside. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a little, was a little squash for him. He can't deal with that sort of thing too well. He, was, he stood outside and listened. They're pretty sort of open to rock and roll and whatnot. Mum listens to it while she's cleaning the house, she said. Really? Yeah. <laughs> the decision to put out a seven inch straight up, is that really based on having access? Because yeah, we worked there and I couldn't get it done cheap and also that's what I buy rock and roll on so that's, I don't really like CD so I don't really have to worry about it. Yeah, that's it's good. It's more of a present when you buy a 7 inch. Oh, this is a 
got a pretty much like one take live type thing? Or? Yeah, I mean... I yeah, think, two or three songs. Yeah, with the album, I think maybe they'll probably know something we did more than twice. Yeah, we don't want to overtake them while we're trying to record them because it sort of kills them. How important is the playing live thing to you guys? Yeah, I think it's the guts of it. Well, no, well recording is a bonus because we've got our own stuff where we can do it ourselves, so I don't have any pressure there. But yeah, the live shows are the, probably the best best part about it. I remember when um when when we first were doing those few songs. For me, I didn't even think we were going to play a gig. I thought we would just record these songs. So I was like, yeah, sick. Danny was like, well, you know, all the boys were like, we should do a, a gig to show you know our friends what we've been doing. And at first, I wasn't. I wasn't. I was, I was sort of a bit nervous to do that. I didn't think I could pull it off. Yeah, it was a lot of fun doing that first show. So sort of after that, it was like, ah, oh, so this is what it's like playing live, you know? This is cool. Yeah, yeah. we had a good turnout there at first, first gig, so it was, it was a good response. Our friends have been really good to us and have always turned up. And then, I know the more shows you play, the more people you meet. New people will come along and you kind of make friends with them. So you sort of feel comfortable out there anyway. Yeah, yeah. Like, and even if you don't know them, they sort of they kind of when you're out there and they're having fun, it's sort of like they feel like you're they're your friends anyway. So it's sort of it's like, well, this is all right, you know. No one's no one's trying to punch you or anything. I was a really big sort of bread makers fan when I was a sort of teenager, and that was a, my brother took when I first turned eighteen. That was the first gig that um, he took me up to up the city. And then from there, just sort of seeing the Kawis and the Exotics and all those sort of bands were probably the most impressive for me. I guess when you really like a band that no one else sort of maybe cares about or knows about, I like playing with them and sort of going, you know, you guys should really watch this. You know, to see people like amazed by a band that's been around for 10 years or something that they're seeing for the first time. As I remember, after a show or something, you come on and you go, oh, how good was that? And you know, it was a buzz. And then, you know, for us, maybe to be doing that for other people, yeah, that's shit off. File sharing and people getting your music for nothing and stuff. I don't really care. Yeah. Doesn't, yeah. doesn't bother me. We're not really doing it to make mad cash, you know, so. Yeah, no, I, 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 don't, I don't think we're the type of band that that's really... Like yeah. You're not making any money anyway, so it doesn't matter. Make and it's more people hearing it. Yeah, that's what I think also. I think when you go out and buy something and have it in your hand, you appreciate it a bit more. Even with burnt CDs, you like you end up just leaving them lying around. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, yeah. Don't have the same respect. Yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess it's like kids, the parents that buy them everything, they don't, ex they don't respect it. I find yeah. even on MySpace and that, I, I, even if the song's good, I can't be bothered listening for more than... 30 seconds, just I just I can't sit there and look at a computer and watch all these songs go by. It's um, just wanted to ask about one song Insufficient Funds. I guess it's just you know, we all go through times of not having much money. Yeah. You go to your bank and there's no money in there, you're like, fuck. Well, no matter how Simple much as you that. earn, you always <laughs> think, wow, you know, it's just I could get that, but I don't have that amount of money. Even when you got money, you still feel like you're not, you know. Every time I spend my money, I'm like, Fuck yeah. you know, that's two dollars more than I wanted to pay, you know, and yeah, sort of whether you're on the dole or whether you're making heaps of cash, it sort of doesn't really matter, you know, because I you're guess you're having have fun. Enough. Yeah, yeah, so it's like <laughs> you may as well just have, have a bit of fun, I guess. You know. Get up, morning. I'm not 
on the door Cause I'd get your feet on the floor You get out what it Up and out of bed You get out what it Nothing going on in my head I'm Reese. We're Bang Bang Aids. We're just two rat kids from Bendigo, Victoria. About two hours drive on the Calder. We're getting a Nando's. <laughs> yeah. Basically, it's guitar, drums, and horns, and flugel, and trumpet, and some singing. <laughs> we do some like floor tom and cymbals and tambourines and stuff. One time, even a xylophone. There's one guy with a hose, like you can do pitching with a hose. That was kind of good. What was it called? The elephant. Dino and the Amazing Elephant Tube, or something. Myself and Reese played um, a lot together since maybe we were 16 or something like that. We sort of made this one initially just to really piss the people at uni off because we were doing this Battle of the Bands thing and thought we'd um, you know just try stick it to the man. Ironically, people ended up sort of enjoying it and that fucked us up real hard. Yeah. So we figured we might as well start writing some songs and whatever song you write you play guitar on we just swap around and you like if i write a, a kick-ass riff and I, <laughs> and I do um then i bring it like i don't teach it to him because he just couldn't hack it so and i can't play drums so that's kind of interesting too <laughs> yeah, yeah like something exciting is going to happen yeah when you have no talent whatsoever like, yeah mm. it's kind of yeah. good redneck so, redneck rock or something it's kind of odd i mean we've had sort of people like 40 50 year old rockers like old Bendigo rockers and shit really enjoy it and then just um, crazy fucking retarded 15 year olds and shit like I mean it's a lot of people hate our guts yeah there's it's, a lot of people who hate our guts yeah it's, it's all these massive egos actually it's really odd yeah. <laughs> huge egos and people have only played in Bendigo and played like a few shows and because they're popular they just get this monstrous ego and you can't deal with it it's just a big boys club and everyone's sucking each other's dicks and we're not in the boys club at all, right? Nah. <laughs> no one wants if to If we were, we'd be, we'd be the bitches too, which <laughs> yeah. is like... Yeah, it's a big town. There's stacks and stacks of bands, there's gigs every weekend, like there's... But there's nothing really interesting, there's just the stock standard gigs. Bendigo people are, I mean, fairly conservative. You know what you're gonna get, and there's nothing really excitement or that... It's not really like a sort of anyone, you know, doing a DIY kind of thing down there either. I mean, there were some guys, but that was sort of... Um, money profiteering kind of fucking 
current, well, I just finished uni actually doing a psychology degree, which probably won't help me one little bit. But, uh, currently, I work in a pizza shop. That's kind of grand. Yeah. I enjoy I, that. <laughs> I also work at said pizza shop. It's the best. It's awesome then. But Pete and I, the trumpet player, are doing fourth year primary school teaching. So next year we might have a job and some disposable income. Well, I, it's, I have to sort of... The kids are like, what's your band name? And I'm just like, oh... Petrol. Don't have yet. <laughs> we don't have one yet, actually. We've released one, just one EP. Just a seven track EP. I don't like we... the term EP, I like the term masterpiece. Oh, uh, okay. We, yeah, we recorded a seven track masterpiece. <laughs> we did like eight hours of tracking and then lost every single second of it. We just soon. finished and then it all got wiped. And we were laughing. Like, we thought it was funny, but the guy that recorded us, he was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> we did it all again, like, we was like, fuck, let's go, bam. Yeah. I like the fuck ups on the record, actually. They're pretty funny. One giant fuck up. Our lives. Oh, uh, just got little kids to design the artwork, so every cover's different. How terrible was the one with the girl, like, the, there was like a window. Uh, with the tear coming out of the girl's yeah, eye. Blood and a knife and, stuff. and shit. Yeah, and then there's one like this gun shooting the flare and stuff. Like a production line, little kids. Like, hurry up, hurry up, come on. We'll pass the next one down to them. <laughs> Off they go. Yeah. Marcus survived. The morning after pill and a condom. <laughs> no, mum was on the pill when she got pregnant with me. So either I'm like really tough, like I was a real awesome sperm. Or um... I reckon that was written on my... Dad was real good, or... <laughs> Dad was real good. <laughs> you ready for this? <laughs> oh, um, Power up, we like... <laughs> well, like, I'm so rat-like now that the pill took away all the good attributes, like... The, the sperm got stripped, and all I got was like a tail entering mum's egg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Parentals, they... or might... They don't care about who you're supporting, they care about the money. Like, oh, did you make much money? Like, well, I made petrol money. To get there and back, that's enough, that's about it. I think he sort of understands, we've sort of been playing, I mean, most weekends and it's not really easy to constantly play shows, you know, week in, week out yeah. and, you know, manage not to die. And at the same time, like, yeah, they're sort of unfamiliar with um, where we're playing and it doesn't really sound very credible to them for yeah. us to be just, you know, where are you playing? Well, some guy's house, you know. Yeah. Guy Lawrence's house, just this massive fucking mansion, just backed onto this waterfront with all these yachts and shit, and just played in like this crazy little boat shed, just this tiny little sort of room with people jiving and dancing. And I think the thing with travelling is like, the sh like it's good to play shows and I mean, elsewhere, but it's more about the people you meet and like you just meet these awesome people that you wouldn't have met out otherwise. We saw Paul Kelly and we had at Paul and he stopped and looked and we could find this like glass bus stop so he could see us. <laughs> Just didn't look at him again. Then he went to Baskin and Robbins. We don't really have any values. Well, I think you just do what you do, and you do what feels right, and you do what you like. And if you start putting limitations on yourself, it's not much point playing music. There's no deep philosophy or like reasons, and we don't do pros and cons of doing a show. Like if it sounds fun and we think it's just going to be good, then we'll do it. Like, yeah, we're not very political. Like we're just kids with ADD, really. Let me sort of find just something kidding. boring about writing songs in 4-4. We just sort of took this approach and said, we'll play that that pattern 13 times, and this one three, and so these prime numbers. It's like prime number rock or something. Write the song, have it there, and then look at the first bit, do this X amount of time, cut that in there, put this here, and I don't know. We Try work with numbers we know, like phone numbers and things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we don't forget shit. I would be so happy if I typed in Bang May Aids in like Soul Seek and our name came up. Like, they can take our music, you can burn our CD, that's fine, like go for it. Yeah, until we get signed to Sony, then we hate it. Yeah, that's it. Mm. And the majority of music I've probably acquired has been through that <laughs> fucking source. I mean, who, who am I to fucking badmouth the file sharing system? Yeah, long live it. Everyone's stolen something in their lives. I used to shoplift like from this news agency in Bendigo called Pounties and take 11 magazines and put them all around my belt and then put them in my socks and have to walk out like a bubble. I never, I never expect to make money from music that I write or to make a living off it, like I never expect that and that's, that's fine like. Yeah, we'd have to get a lot of 25 cent things from APRA to make some money. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Who the fuck are we to give advice to anyone? 
I think the success would be just being real proud of what you what you've done and when you got your kids and um, you know they're like kids. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll probably reproduce when a woman falls asleep. And I can tell my kids like, oh, I did this CD and here's I played all these shows and and you really and you look back and you're real proud of it. Well, dad. Dad talks about all the old rock shows, <laughs> rock shows he used to do. I just laugh at him, mate. Right? Yeah, Your kids are just going to laugh at you. Oh, they will anyway. Like, but that's success. That would be success for me. Anyway. Although, I mean, Dad did a show where a guy got shot with a rifle out the front. So, I mean, <laughs> that's well, success. That, that is, is success. success. When we got played on Triple J, like I thought, fuck, some guy would have been got, getting a head job listening to this rat's voice. <laughs> She yeah. would have been his dick off. <laughs> yeah, change, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. That is awesome. That's success. Yeah, that's success. Closing words. Hello. Just have fun. That's all we've done. I had. You can still be serious and have fun, but like you can still sing about things you care about and, or like express yourself and still have fun. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. If you're not having fun, you just ain't living.
Cameron. Hey. I'm Monica. I'm Evelyn. And Ben. Baseball. Started <laughs> so a long time ago and it was a thing to do in my bedroom, then it became a band thing in 2002 in Scotland, and then we toured Europe twice and Asia a few times, and now it's this. It's been quite a few different lineups. Yeah, it's a long story, I'm trying to. Mm -hmm. Well, the last lineup was Cameron, myself, and. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> so the last lineup was, <laughs> was Cameron, myself, and. Uh, a guy called Yoshi, and he was Japanese, and unfortunately he had to leave and go back to Japan, so we found ourselves without a bass player, so I kind of took on a role as full-time bass player and recruited Evelyn on drums and Ben on guitar. We all play in other bands as well. So. Yeah. Monica and I are in a black metal band mm. called The Group. The Group. <laughs> <laughs> We've been able to kind of play with lots of different kinds of bands, um, you know, bands like Dad They Broke Me, who are kind of more, you know, heavy sort of metal stuff. And Agents of Abhorrence, Agents so it's of Abhorrence brutal so grind. Yeah. Brutal grind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, and, that, and everyone's been fairly accepting of, of what we're doing, which is really cool. We also play with, you know, more indie bands and, mm. and even some sort of arty stuff, and it seems to go down fairly well. Sort of making that bogan art school crossover. <coughs> I don't think the term bogan in Australia is as harsh and derogatory. Negative and derogatory yeah. Bogan's rough. They know how to, they're, got, they're there to have a good time. They don't care what the fuck's going on. They're just like, right, party. Oh, yeah. What's this? Oh, it's a bit weird. Oh, no, nah, it's all right. <laughs> Everyone knows, knows that ACDC rules and you know, they're, they're bogan icons. You know. <laughs> Warrnambool's pretty bogan. <laughs> Jihad Against America tried to play in Warrnambool and um, we were a bit scared. I think it'd be really cool to do some shows. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, to do like country yeah. shows. And, oh, yeah, to do a yeah. tour of, of yeah. Australia. Yeah. I've played in Benigo yeah. before and it was pretty amazing fun. Yeah. But at the yeah. same time, I mean, I've, I've, when I've been, I've got a friend that lives in Albury and when I've been there before and walking down the street just wearing stripy socks, I've got some fierce calls. Mm. <laughs> Well, we had a good flight into Taiwan that, oh, yeah. uh, that Cameron really enjoyed. There was lightning and Cameron was sitting there gripping his diary, just going, praying. Yeah, I thought I was going to die on that. Trip. Yeah, because there was lightning all around the plane. And, it was... and we're flying through the tail end of a typhoon that ended up <coughs> wiping out the festival that was supposed to be. Yeah. Everyone that we met, all the bands we met, were really enthusiastic about coming to Australia. It makes so much sense because it's so close. It's so much closer than America or Europe. And... Yeah, I think there should be a lot more touring between Japan and Australia and Taiwan and Australia, for sure. Your violin does cop quite a bit of abuse, Cam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not much. It's pretty hard to tell. Like it's just a bit of wood. Believe it or not, this is very important. <laughs> it's a lucky charm, isn't it? Well, it's my violin. Uh. <laughs> and even if Rogan, that's all I've got left. It's a good idea if you just want to find out about new music. Mm -hmm. And as far as like, I, I always really like um, recommending bands to people and it's heaps easier to just send them an email. Yeah. I mean, I, I always get really annoyed when I lend my CDs out and they don't come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and trying to book shows overseas as well, like being able to just send MP3s to people mm -hmm. that can hear music. I used to book shows before the net came around and, and there was, was a lot of work sending letters out and actually making phone calls. You guys have toured before, but I reckon this must have been the easiest to book, you reckon? Yeah, fairly easy. Lots of people get all nervy about, you know, people being able to get music for free on the internet. And people mm. get really wrong. But I mean, everyone reacts that way to, to new technology. And, and that, like that MySpace thing has been cool mm. as well. Like, I don't know, maybe it's got a way to go, but, um, you know, we got people to gigs. Lots of people come and do shows in Japan because of because of MySpace, we mm. post a lot of shows on there. And... <laughs> yeah, I love listening right, to vinyl, right. but it's, it's such a difficult thing to do, yeah. to be able to put out your own. No, just go sing to do it for the world, though. No, they, yeah, they've sold all their vinyl. 
Yes. And it's cool because yes. it gives it a collectible quality and it gives it like, I think it's really nice. But mm. um, they had, you know, they had to go a bit more effort. It does make sense if you, if you can actually sell that many records on vinyl. Then you should, yeah. Maybe we should do it. <laughs> yeah, but also if your record fucks up. You still gotta play it, like if you get a scratch or two, you hear the scratches, but you're still gonna play the record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And, and you're gonna, like, mm. but when a CD fucks up, and it pretty much fuck off CD, like, mm -hmm. you don't want, you don't care. But. Yeah, I think, that, I think the artwork's really important. And I think um, that that's one thing that, that um, downloading music might sort of put more of an emphasis on is that like, you know, if you want to buy a record, you want to buy it because it looks really good or it's got some sort of tac tactile quality to it where you can touch it. And and I think I think that could actually become something that's more of a nerdy thing, like it's more of a, you know, people who are actually sort of dedicated to, to buying records yeah. will, will do that. It's like, it's like saying, oh, you're a female bike rider. <laughs> like, oh, I, you're, a, you're a female labourer. So I didn't think about it until I went on tour and I had people coming up to me and saying, I've never seen a girl jump before, I can't believe you can do that, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. You know, just do what you do. And, and occasionally you get the old, um, oh, you're a pretty good drummer for a girl. I had one guy tell me once that, that he thought that women couldn't be as good drummers because they physically don't have the capability. It's the same as playing piano to me, like, which is what I did before drums, so it's the same mm. sort of thing. Because basically, as far as I'm concerned, women and men are pretty much the same. Maybe maybe women don't feel as confident or something. I don't know, but you can't really make such a broad statement about that kind of thing. I don't and maybe it's because men want to get laid more. <laughs> and they think that if they play in a band, they, they might get laid more. <laughs> Predominantly in my, in my bedroom or my bathroom, come up with some rhythms and chords and show these guys. And Sometimes writing an entire song on the violin. And then we make it into a song. Mm. Yeah, we all we all put our bit in. Mm -hmm. all sort of, we all say enough at working, what's working, or mm. but it always ends up, you know, pretty good. If I write them at home, I'll, I'll the lyrics will come to me in some way or another in the course of time. So. And with everyone, it was after the jam and had some lyrics. Next jam. Yeah, I've only really ever written those lyrics that are, oh, I've written lots of lyrics but they're the only ones I've ever been happy with. <laughs> I sometimes write down random lyric lines or I think oh that'd be good. Uh, yeah most music is like having something inside you that you you, you want to get it out somehow so mm. when you've got that inside you and it's wanting to come out or you like it's hard to try and do something like that. <clears throat> oh it's just that some people do it through lyrics and some people do it through other things. Exactly. Through, instruments. Yep. Yeah. through, through their instruments. I don't think that that we're in some sort of obscure community that, like I think there's a lot of people that don't listen to commercial radio. I, I realised that more and more when I was teaching music at high schools because there was like, there was the kids that listened to the punk and the rock music and then there was the all the else. other kids and, and um, it was a really major obvious divide. Because I think mainstream culture, like they're the bogans of the, of the new generation. <laughs> And I re like they're, they're being fed whatever they get fed, and they yeah, they, they, they only go one yeah. place to eat, which is commercial, you know, I media. Guess. I reckon if we went out and played to a bogan audience, which we did in Japan a couple mm. times, you know, if if, if you know if they thought we were rocking, yeah, I guess it's just it. that there's I'll no search. That's what I'm saying. Like there's no search involved with that kind of audience. It's basically they, they don't search. They no. accept what what is given to them on the radio, and what they're told is is, is good music. Top coldest guy to playing next to him, I just go. And so, for those people who are filming this last song, it's time to probably start rolling tape.
Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. My name is Alex. I play banjo and sing. I'm Janita. I play bass and backing vocals and dance. Hi. I'm Schultz. Hi, oh, howdy. I'm Schultz. I also dance and occasionally play an instrument called the drums. Dance is obviously a large portion of the Alex and the Rams experience. We're all quite, you know, gifted contemporary dancers in our own. Mm. Right, so... We're all exhibitionists, more to the point. <laughs> we got to change it. It's yeah. been around for too long. It's all out of the old, in with the new warm-up routine slash dance routine. I think it was when we first started, we didn't have a dance routine. I, I think I just had this backing track that was a mashup of Slayer and um, Missy. Khalees and Missy Elliott. And, um, and, I was just, and we just danced around for a while. I think it's a really good way of just kind of like clearing the air before you start playing. It's filling the void of the Melbourne indie thing or any kind of music scene. There's just not enough dancing. That's there have actually, been several injuries. Yeah. Alex had a huge scar in his knee. Yeah. From, uh, from, actually, I'm going to... From this falling is, on a broken glass. Well, this is, I think this is actually shower. from the one that you guys filmed <coughs> when Joe jumped oh, on yeah, me. You yeah. also broke a beer glass. And I had blood running down. Doesn't look that impressive anymore. It's actually quite well, like it's quite tightly orchestrated. The music doesn't just sort of spaz out into, we don't do like big spazzy um, smash out jam things, except yeah. maybe at the end. Like I'm terrified of improvisation. <laughs> we it's used to be like... jazz musicians. <laughs> we used yeah. to masquerade as jazz We used to masquerade <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of like, the tone will always be different and yeah. smash stuff different. Like, mm. like it, you go out there and you put all your shit <laughs> on the line, like, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I usually just write stuff on banjo and maybe have some lyrics. Just kind of go through it chronologically. I'll come up <laughs> with like an opening two minutes of a song and then we'll learn it and we're like, so what goes on after that? I'm not really sure. <laughs> Which probably has a lot to do with why some of the songs are so fragmented. Like we recently recorded and there's, yeah, there's lots of songs where people are playing on instruments that they don't usually play on. Which yeah. has made it really annoying for us to learn the songs. Like who? Made this up and it was Simon. Yeah. Oh, here's Simon. I brought pastries. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hi, camera. I'm Simon and I play guitar and scream and sing. Uh, and dance. And dance. And dance. Yeah. Been through that. Guys, yeah. like touring was. We've been to Sydney and back via Canberra. Mm. But I don't know, I really want to tour Japan. New Zealand and Japan. Japan. <laughs> They're weird, we're yeah. weird. We might like, frighten them a little bit. No way, you'd have to do a lot yeah, to practice in Japanese. You'd have to like... Our eat. dance moves might you have to, you'd, have to, you'd, have to, you'd have to murder yourself. Like no, you'd have to make, yourself. like put yourself through a sausage the, the, the <laughs> machine. Yeah. And the extruding out. <laughs> but you'd have to be on fire as well. Because otherwise they'd just be like... <laughs> a memorable uh, Alex and the Ramps experience. Mmm. Mm. Oh, the whole thing. There's so many. <laughs> there was Schultz's... Schultz's keyboard line in the recording sessions. We set up our own kind of studio on near Great Ocean Road to record our album. You know, all five of us were pretty much never there at the same time. And, and there was one night when it was just me and Joe and Schultz, 
and we were pretty wasted. <laughs> <laughs> and we pretty much just like hit record and just like, we're just, you know, playing stuff. And I was listening back to it the other day and it's pretty unlistenable, the stuff we were doing. <laughs> Except for this one little pocket where Schultz It was just, the first section, it, that was the first. And Schultz just started playing this like... <laughs> Hit stop. Side one, track one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I can never remember that? that I don't play keyboards. <laughs> couldn't replicate it, couldn't think about replicating no. it. I think, I think Joe, being the kind of musical nerd that he is, actually went through and figured out how to play it. Like, it's a really intricate, weird... I like to think of it like a, like a, a ghostly Viking yeah. ship. <laughs> <laughs> I'm washing dishes in a pizza restaurant, but I am usually a student. I just finished my philosophy degree. I'm on the doll, and uh, but I do contract work for IKEA. I currently work in the box office of the Moonlight Cinema, but um, if any real estate agents are watching, I'm a florist. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've got connection that there's any real estate. <laughs> I'm not really on the doll. Um, um, what am I again? I'm a music instructor. Yeah. yeah. Um. I work at a hospital. It's like being the doll because I don't do anything, in there, but they pay me a lot more than the doll. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I drive a van around and listen to the radio and call people and just talk shit all day. Yeah. I'll be back there tomorrow. <laughs> in order, order to be in a van and do do your thing, you kind of sacrifice a lot of other stuff. No, really. Um, we don't have much trouble with it. I think we're all reasonably committed. If I wasn't playing in a band, I wouldn't be working more. That's would still be on the doll. <laughs> you know, it's not a sacrifice. Yeah. I think that um, the being in Melbourne uh, is definitely encouraging to like not feel like it's desperate to be doing music mm -hmm. and feel like, oh, maybe I should go and use my degree in accounting or whatever. Not that I have one, but you know, that kind of thing. I think you can you know, feel like you're doing something good with your time. You mean as in putting it up there and people can do with it? I think that really works for a mm. relatively low-level amateur-esque band who's fantastic because people get to hear you. <laughs> when it comes down to it, artists generally don't make any money off records. Yeah, you make it off yeah. too. Who gives a crap if they're giving you like five cents or, you know, if you get yeah. like five dollars from an album, it makes no difference. Yeah. What you want is exposure and you want to sort of you know, make an impact. But then again, like, if the record label isn't making money, then it means that there's no money to go forth into making more records. I think it's nice for people to be able to hear music immediately, and I still think the same people go out and buy yeah. records for the romance of it anyway. Yeah, yeah but I mean, the, the thing is, we made our record on how many thousand dollars? Like, oh, probably five and a half, five. Mm -hmm. I just think, with the thing is, with the technology, six, with the technology so available, people yeah. can make albums without a record company, you know, building a yeah. huge studio. Yeah. It's just not the same. It's not the same scene anymore, and to maintain yeah. this sort of monolithic um, corporate yeah. structure mm. just doesn't. I don't. I don't think it's necessary. Even. Yeah. What, what do you <laughs> guys hope that the audience takes away from uh, an Alex on the Rams experience? A slightly mm. fuzzy hair. Minor head. cuts. <laughs> Merchandise. <laughs> well, no, in the sense of fun, Maybe. like yeah. yeah, we're not a serious kind of band in terms of. You know, trying to get the point across or something, or just being mm. really, mm, you know, if we're, we're we're screaming all the time, but there's a big fucking grin on our faces. Somebody said that they were feeling depressed for a lot of reasons, and they came to an Alex and the Ramp show, and they forgot about all their cares. If somebody can get pleasure from watching me please myself. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I constantly turn around to each other and just go, are we actually doing this? Did people pay money to come in and watch us do this?
Ben. This is Kaylee. Hi. <laughs> We're from Cold It's Glider. Cold It's Glider is a glider, funnily enough, from Cold It's. Cold It's had a, a prisoner of war camp in World War II. A whole bunch of uh, aviators and guys that were shot down um, were taken there by the Nazis. And they um, spent four and a half years there. And in that time, they built a glider in the attic to escape. There's a pretty smackingly obvious metaphor in there, you know, about sort of feeling a bit trapped by your surround in your surroundings, you know, not being able to, uh, I guess, get out what you want, you know, be it musically or, you know. So I guess that's sort of what it's about. It's like sort of like building something together in this sort of, you know, vain hope that you're going to get somewhere with it, you know. You started, so you better. I sort of started writing stuff because I wanted to get a, a rock band together, and I was starting uh, a course back in 2003, I think, 2002. And I met Lyndon, the other guitarist there, and um, we just started writing. That because we I'd, we'd met Ben from the cafe from the Good Morning Captain because our school was right over the road from that, and he gave us the number of a drummer called Luke, and then. We really wanted a gig. One night we were at the captain and getting rowdy and I think Ben just decided he'd play bass. Yeah. Because he's a guitar player, so... And then you asked me if I had a rig and or a bass. <laughs> and said I said no, no so Kaylee told me to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Something must have happened. I think, yeah, you guys went through a few bass players, so... And he I, had a free rehearsal space, so... Fine. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just a, a creative space slash cafe slash venue that um, myself and a guy called Andy Jackson um, opened up in um, mid-2002 because it wasn't a huge space, it was just a, a back room, it was just a terrace house so it was just a good place for fans to play their first gigs or we'll just get to meet other guys and yeah, it was a pretty relaxed atmosphere I think and it wasn't that confronting when you walked in, I think it was pretty homely because it was a home, you know, I lived there, Andy lived there for a point, uh, for a time and Three years of business is, you know, for a musician and a poet is <laughs> is, is testing. Yeah, like my disco had their first gig there. Because of Ghosts had their first gig there. We had Coldest, our first gig there. We had our first gig there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had underage shows there every every Saturday, Sunday, pretty much. Created a lot of opportunities for me and for everyone around it. I think when you put when you put yourself out there, you put a space out there. And it's just yeah, it's interesting. People kind of make it their own and you yeah, turn into something completely different to what you had in mind. It's pretty vast. There's like there's a lot of scenes in Melbourne, you know, I think the crossover is pretty good though. Like from, from say like indie to hardcore to, to rock is, is pretty close. You know, a lot of people kind of float in and around. It's really healthy in Melbourne. There's a lot of bands, a lot of venues, uh, a lot of community radio support, a little bit of government funding, you know. A lot of good, interesting, experimental, artistic bands happening, especially at the moment. Yeah, a, a lot of history too in Melbourne and, you know, I think we're proud of that. I guess, you know, you put a band together and you get a gig, you know, and <laughs> you get another one and I suppose it's not really that hard, is it? No, it's pretty <laughs> easy. <laughs> like, maybe um, making those steps to the sort of, you know, getting international. Maybe that's a bit harder because uh, a lot of bands that can do that um, can pull resources from government and things like that. Um, and there's a lot more competition for those fundings and things like that in Melbourne because there's a lot more people going for it. <laughs> well, I don't know, one thing I've noticed with, with, with the overseas thing, independent bands are starting to do it, you know, by yeah. themselves. And, Just get out there, yeah. And I think that's inspiring for a lot of people because there seems to be this general consensus that, you know, it's so so accessible now and so possible to go, yeah. to go overseas and there's like underground little subcultures everywhere. I mean, all you have to do is back yourself and just, just bite the bullet, I think. Yeah, it depends what you want out of music. I think, you know, like, if you want it to express yourself and, and, and do a bit of travel and have a fucking great time, you know, it's, it's, it's doable. If you want to make millions of dollars, you know, it's hard to write that pop song, you know. Yeah, it's not something that we're into. I think, like, being realistic, we, we can kind of take a perspective of, you know, if there's people that like us here and support us here, there's people that can support us overseas, not necessarily thousands of people, but enough to, you know, warrant travelling. It's a toughie. Yeah, that's always the hard one. Mm. It's obviously like this sort of combination of the four of us, you know, and we're all into 
so many different types of music. And I guess that's what happens, you know, when you when you stick sort of four different people into the same room, ask them to sort of try and express themselves. You're gonna end up with this, you know, pretty weird thing. Unless you've all got some sort of like, yeah, we're gonna be like a, a post-hardcore electro thrash disco band, you know, then you can all sort of go, right, cool, all right. But when you don't want anything that is gonna sort of um, box you in or or, cha or sort of iconize your music, um, you end up with some really weird shit, you know. Yeah. It's pretty cool because <laughs> you end up in these places where you never thought you'd go. You're like, how the hell did I end up playing like this, or you know, thinking about music like this? You know, it's, mm. it's kind of enlightening, you know, just to let people in your band be what they are. Yeah. You know, and then try and um, embellish it, you know, and and add to it. We we try to embrace the inner geek sometimes. Yeah, I think yeah. like you know, if someone comes up with a part. You know, could be cheesy but it could be beautiful it's like it's all right man you know let's let's go down that road you know like yeah. like anything's possible you know and then we can write this hard ass math metal bullshit bit and um and be really proud of that too our, our sound and our music is all about just uh, no rules i think Our songs are pretty much, you know, a bunch of different ideas kind of falling into each other. But um, there's a huge emphasis on arranging too. It's not just like we're going, all right, here's a riff, here's a riff, here's a riff. Like, there is, you know, a lot of thought that goes into it. You really sort of want to put your own fingerprint in your music, you know, and just know that it's special because, like, no other combination of people would come up with that, you know. Even even alternative songwriting and alternative rock and all that is turned into its own, you know, uh, monster, you know. So why would you um, why would you bother exploring that? I was going to have a look at something else, you know. What's your thoughts on the <clears throat> like the, the whole manufacturing thing, like the Australian Idol? I think it's pretty funny. It's not selling music to musicians or you know music lovers. I think it's just selling it to a mass market, and, and it's so there, therefore it's hollow. You know, it yeah, doesn't mean anything. It's kind of like beaming through your television. You know, not. At your local pub, or so it's sort of it's a bit sort of uh, McDonald'sy, a bit bit fast foodish, you know. I don't know. It just seems so silly, you know. Like, but that's from uh, someone who's interested in music. You know? And it's turning it into a competition, you know. Already, right at the start, this is this is wrong because I mean, there's always going to be musicians that are better than you. There's always going to be people that are worse than you, you know. But it's not. Music for me, and I think for us, is just about self-expression. And you know, who needs you know anyone else to tell you that you know you're expressing yourself the wrong way? You know, and maybe you are expressing yourself the wrong way when you're being told exactly what to do and exactly what to look like, and you know the whole package. So they can just get fucked. I don't know. It's, it's just a ridiculous concept, and it, it's very shallow. spend most of our lives in Melbourne, but Ben and I grew up um, in England, um, but yeah, it's another story. So. For me it was kind of like, you know, throughout my you know, teens I was kind of, you know, skating and going to punk shows in Melbourne and, and that's kind of, you know, what I did in between, uh, in between high school and, and various kind of odd jobs. More all ages shows then as well, almost every week, like on a Sunday or Saturday in the day, there'd be like, you know, four or five bands playing at a rehearsal room. Probably like, um, Wax Studios. Mm, yeah, yeah. Places like Richmond, there. like, yeah, there were frequently shows there. Fairly diverse in the, the punk hardcore thing. Mm. 
Like there are a lot of different style bands and it seemed like a fairly creative scene back then. Mm. That always attracted like heaps of kids from like as young as probably 12 or 13. It sort of felt pretty amazing that you could just go to this small place and see like bands from interstate. It kind of inspires you to kind of want to go out and start a band and, and kind of be a part of it. Music's like pretty awesome. <laughs> No, like, like it's all, it's all I do. Like, you just listen to loads of music, play yeah. it all the time. It's, it's like a big cycle of like listening to music, yeah. then getting inspired, playing music, then recording, then touring, then hanging out, and then yeah. meeting loads of new people. If I wasn't playing music ever, yeah, mm, probably uh, studying, like probably. Going to school and being a Dara? <laughs> I don't know. I'd play in the AFL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's hard to say, but I'd imagine I'd still be at university. No, there's, there's a lot of planning because it takes a hell of, you know, often quite a long time to actually set something up and, and, and make it work, especially when you, you, you're talking about tours and uh, touring internationally. I wouldn't roll out um, just letting things organically happen though, like we were on a record again, but we don't really like go, oh yeah, we have to do it like on September the 18th. That's another good thing about doing your own label, you don't have to like have people say, oh, can you like have it ready by this date? Because that would be an, an extra stress that no one needs when you're trying to like write songs. I'd say we're writing it like, if we're happy with it, then, then that's a good song. We don't think like, oh, I wonder if people would like this bit. That comes that, with that's come with more commercial songwriting, which I don't know anything about. We all sort of jam things out and it's kind of fairly varied, I think. Yeah, I'd say all the new songs were like, what happened really quickly. We don't compose and then bring anything to rehearsal. Everything sort of happens as a, I don't know, a three piece. Because yeah. we like work on rhythm most of the time we come up with something like a, a bass line and a beat. We spend a lot of time at Bakehouse. Yeah. Uh, rehearsal rooms. It can get frustrating though yeah. because something when one idea is really good and you want to try your best to make it work but then it just doesn't go anywhere. You spend a lot of time doing it and, and, and we want it right and, and what we're saying through our instruments we want to kind of be as clear as possible. It's pretty hard to listen back yeah. and you always have thoughts of what could have been done differently mm. or but I don't know. That's that's how it goes when you document yeah. something like that. to do a whole range of shows as well like we've played like sometimes on the same weekend like a you know like a crusty warehouse show and then like a real nightclub sort of trendy show and then like we've played like all ages uni shows the point of it is to play to as many people as we can and pretty cool to like keep it diverse so you're not playing to the both a the same crowd all the time and b like the same places because that can get pretty stale so you'd have no problem doing like a Coca-Cola live and local time? Oh well. You That's know. getting it out there, isn't it? it? It's kind of, you know, in a different in a different way. We can tour independently and, and play shows independently to, you know, sponsored festivals are, you know, fine, but, you know, that's not what we're doing right now. We're really particular about our sound and stuff, and after going to the US, where most of the stuff's made and you get heaps of good music equipment for half the price you can get here, it's real tease. Yeah. It's an expensive lifestyle when you think about it. Um, I think it'd be very hard to do it ten years ago, what we've done, especially places like Southeast Asia. Mm. Um, the only contact we had through people were via email. Is Melbourne pretty like a family? I think so, in, in some ways. Lots of bands that we play with regularly. 
which is just the nature of like, you know, it's a pretty small city and not heaps of people, so then we find that everywhere. Like in the States, it's the same, from city to city. The cities have their own scenes and... I think yeah. Melbourne right now is, uh, has a lot of good music and a lot yeah. of good things going on. It's just great to be a part of that, I guess. You came down with a vacuum cleaner and sucked out three or four of the bands that you regularly played with in Melbourne. How would that impact on you guys? What's a big vacuum? Yeah. <laughs> no, if, yeah, like you're right. Like if you picked like the right four bands or something, with with you know similar members or whatever, it'd probably limit things a little bit. But new stuff always starts up. I found out the other day there's this band that just started with some housemates of mine, and I I sort of did the math in my head, and that every member of the band was a member of another band. Who's, who was either their bands were away or their members were away or they were on hiatus. So they just did it to like waiting for their other bands to come back. That was pretty cool. Jobs and that. It's dead end work. Pay the bills. Yeah, call buy, centers Buy your air tickets. We've actually been made redundant. <laughs> yeah. Our jobs, so. We've all recently been fired. <laughs> I mean, it's hard at times, but it's the rewards are kind yeah, of it's, worth it. Mm, it's probably the only thing that I would want to work for. Backup plans? For so 10 years down the track, if you're no. not still playing? No. We're doing it for now and, and kind of that's, that's all I'm concerned with. Talk to me in 10 years, see what happens. I don't think we're exactly doing the band like in terms of a profession or anything. Mm. I think it's just something that we're doing now and if we weren't doing the band, I think we'd just sort of <laughs> people that had no ambition yeah. or no goals. <laughs> It'd be weird. Or no life whatsoever, so... I guess like um, a sense of feeling like you're doing something kind of creative. I don't know. It amounts to like a like a, a quality of life or something. Yeah, as a touring band, a lot of people kind of you know from city to city um, appreciate the fact that you've come a long way to yeah. kind of do do what you do, and uh, there's always people kind of willing to put you up or people that are willing to feed you and when we tour even though it's a small level playing like four dollar basement shows to 20 people it still is enough to keep you afloat for the amount of time you're on the road in a way it's a, it's a cheap way to kind of um, travel but in the same time you're in a new city every night so you, you know, you, you know you, you're, not, you're not doing tourist things it's, it's not a holiday you do get to sort of come into a the town and meet people with common interests mm, yeah. straight away and so yeah. it's like you're going to shows every night seeing like three new bands yeah. you would otherwise never see or probably never hear about yeah. uh yeah Again, I, I, I don't, don't know, know nothing about it i know very i know it's probably in, it's in its third season or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the last and thing I'm, i heard of australian idol was the dude that looks like max Guy Sebastian. Guy Sebastian. And but I mean, it's, it's, it's completely different. It's sort of like, because we're vegetarian, and it's sort of like saying, oh yeah, so what do you think about me being out there on the shelves? And we'd go, yeah, we've probably seen it. Wouldn't be able to name any brands. Have Maybe you, like, haven't tasted it. it. Yeah, haven't really tasted it or spent much time with it. It's all a matter of perception, you know, how, how you view kind of how you, how you view or the importance of, you know, the aspects mm. in music and, you know, as musicians, you know, I mean, things like that, you know, how many units you, you sell and, and stuff like that and how heavily pushed a record is, it's kind of, I don't know, it's a, it's a different realm yeah, that's how like, I see it. That's just biz, like 95% business related and maybe 99% business related and 1% about the music or ours is this is vice versa, so it's a different kettle of fish.
lose taste for the paper. that were around when we came out were kind of um, post-rock, I suppose. There was a lot of, sh lot, of sh lot of slow, quiet, introspective music going on in Melbourne, I think. You know, a lot of people sitting down and playing guitars in their laps. And for us, that's what was exciting, to make some loud noise again. Turn up really loud and yeah. play really fast. People seem to respond to that pretty well. It's not like other diagrams could be any types of bands. It's the kind of music that we play because that's what comes naturally to us. But I mean, it has changed over time. I think people who watch the band um, pick up on that perhaps even more than we do. We've never had a discussion about the direction of the band. We jam for <laughs> hours and then we listen back on the tapes and um, construct songs that way. We've got hundreds of tapes and jams at home that have gone forever. In a rehearsal room, someone starts singing something. And it's kind of interesting because sometimes I don't even hear what she's saying properly, but I'll start singing something. We listen back to songs and we're like, hold on, you and me sing about completely different things and stuff. But that's kind of cool, I like that. We used to be instrumental and that was good in a way because we didn't have to explain things to people. The vocals are kind of abstract in a way and so people can still interpret them however they want. As time went on, they ended up being getting shorter and shorter and then made me realise we'd written like 10 three-minute pop, pop songs. songs. <laughs> we're like, okay. We wanted to record it electrical audio. Yeah, and we, we emailed him, we emailed Steve Albini and a few other people, just, you know, wish list kind of people that, you know, would be great to work with. And he just got straight back to us and said that he really likes the MP3s and he wants to... He seemed really excited about it, so it was like, it's great. I think, I think we all have a feeling that we've never really captured how good we can sound live. Basically, when, you, yeah, when you're making a record over here, it's all about trying to get as close to that as possible, trying to get as close to a live sound as you can possibly get. But we should work with somebody like him where, you know, you know that's, like, that's the, 
you know, that's the foundation. He can just nail that straight away. Then you've got the opportunity that you can mess around, you know, experiment with other stuff. Yeah. There isn't that many producers that, um, you know, in Australia that we've, you know, who have made a whole lot of records that we really admire or anything like that. And it's unfortunate, but I think that's the case. Mm. I mean, you always think, I want it to be great if people will like it. <laughs> but that's <laughs> secondary, you know. It's just like trying to make the record you want to make, <clears throat> trying to make it sound the way you've envisioned this song could sound on record. And that's the other really exciting or disappointing thing that when you've finished, when you've mastered it and you listen to it and you're like, yes, did this come out how we wanted it to or not? Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, Australian Idol? I think it's shit. Yeah. It's just. It's it doesn't have much relevance to our world. I mean, people get really upset about it, but I think it's really much different than... I think it's a long history of that kind of manufactured pop music. Mm. And we live in a comfort zone of just not having to do with anything of that kind of world. Like, I don't... Like, uh, you know, my, my parents and my family is into... You know, into, yeah, good music that, you know, that, that I've been influenced by. My parents are both artists, and my sister's a doctor. My other sister's a doctor of philosophy. I'm really the only musician. Mm. Your dad's obsessed with music. Yeah, my dad's like a huge. Uh, I think they're pretty impressed though, of being in a band. They're really impressed. Yeah, I guess we, like, we, we have to work around art school. Are we, yeah. Like we just did a tour of the states and we like had I to work had around um, a going six week yeah. mid year break, and so we went on tour. We had to fit it in there, I making records and making sleeves and stuff like that. We incorporate Love Antonio's artwork. Mm. So, has, you know, and she can uh, submit a lot of that stuff for assessment. So it's like all this time she's working on uh, <laughs> on record sleeves and post tour posters and stuff like that. She's also doing her yeah. artwork for school. So because see, we're just we've got our own things. idea of what we want it to do, and we can do it. Yeah, it's nothing like the art I do at school. It's no, it's completely, completely removed, different. But it's good because it's a different, it's a different kind of. And format, I get really bad marks field. when I hand in, like for when I hand in the stuff I've done for Love of Diagrams in my computer class, they, they don't like it. <laughs> my life got better and better as soon as I started playing music. If I stopped, I don't know if I'd be as happy. The adrenaline rush of getting up on stage, because we're quite nervous people, like you sort of get addicted to that. Like I can't imagine not doing that now. It can be almost like the most hellish experience you've ever had and the greatest experience you've ever had at the same time. Once I'm on stage, it's like something, I don't know, something happens and I'm okay. Beforehand, if someone comes up to me and tries to talk, I just, like, I can't talk to them. I'm just like, oh. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Like, I can't I think... look at Monica, she can't look at me. I know she's nervous, we're just like... Yeah, we all try and not tell each other we're nervous because we yeah. know it makes everybody worse. then it snowballs. <laughs> the thing about that is that you, you, we, we always expected it would get easier. Like, it like, it's just like easier. we haven't done it very much, you know, we'll get used to it, give it six months and we'll get used to playing live, but there's still time. It doesn't like... get easier, but you get used to feeling that level yeah, of anxiety feeling, yeah. and you get used to knowing how to deal with that feeling and to, I suppose to kind of turn it around in some way and, and use it in the performance of the music. What's cool right now is going to be really uncool in a little while so it's just like well, the, unless you have to do with anything about the world of cool and the world of fashion and about what's trendy is like it's got to be the better. <laughs> it's, it's almost a shame that certain bands kind of get the reputation for just being like uh, really hip right now because some of those people are just like playing that music because it's music they've always loved mm. and all of a sudden they get caught up in this thing where they're con considered a fashion band. Melbourne just seemed to be the place to move to. Like all my friends were living there and it was the only place that really had a good live music scene. Sydney was just like being overtaken by pokey machines and San Francisco was kind of tempting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. New York was kind of tempting as well. Yeah, like the East Coast was uh, places like DC and New York and um, quite a lot of them were like house, warehouse parties, like loft parties and, and uh, people's basements and sort of stuff like that. But you, you know, you think it's just someone's house and they get there and you go in the basement, it's like this you know, huge room with a proper, P, you know, big PA and it's like a venue in anywhere else. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a definite, you know, sense of inferiority or there's just as many good bands playing in Melbourne than there are in any other city. Mm. Um, and perhaps even better, more, but I guess that's because we know them. Mm. In America you get bands more like us or our friends' bands, I suppose, that are way more successful. So there's a different kind of success over there that's sort of been made possible through the amount of labels there are and I don't know what else goes into it. How many bands in Australia have got big 
you know, making the kind of music that we like, hardly any of them. Yeah. And any of them that do make it big is when they go overseas and make it over there and come back, like the Dirty mm. Three or something like that. So, I mean, you hit a wall like that, it's like, I don't want to play with bands, you know, that I don't like. Don't I don't want to support them just because we're going to be playing to bigger crowds or a different type of crowd. Like, I, I think it's a certain level where it's kind of interesting to play with different <clears> sorts of bands and see how you go down. We're never going to play with bands that we don't like just because it would be good for our career to do that. We don't make money. We probably just break even, yeah. if that. It's a fantastic totally. way to see the world. I didn't even really, you know, leave my house in Melbourne. It was just my bedroom, you know. <laughs> and then all of a sudden we're like going all over the world yeah. and playing music and yeah. meeting people. But when you're travelling around the world and you're not playing in a band, when you're looking at all those museums and stuff, you're thinking about, where's all the people I'd like to meet in this city, why can't I just, you know, meet all those people? And when you play in a band and um, when you That's tour, you, you to just meet. get plugged straight into, straight you meet, meet the greatest people and have the greatest times. Our plans are just to make records that we really want to make and keep touring around the world and go to places we've never been to and mm. um, and go back to the places we have been to and had a really good time. So like that's that's the mission.
Two and a half years. Yeah. We're from Dunedin, New Zealand. We moved to Auckland and formed a band. Um, we had a band before. We were in lots of bands. We went to high school together in Dunedin. And yeah. How do you fit into the picture? Uh, I just joined the last few months. I was in some other bands in Australia, like um, Skull Hazards, French Horns, and Onox. Hey. Uh, no collective home. Kind of like we're all over the shop. <laughs> Pretty much been touring for how long? Like non stop almost? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much for two and a half years. Yeah, pretty much, and constantly. It's quite hard to base yourself anywhere. And it's, you know, once you're there, you have to get a home and rent and bond and jobs. Jobs and all those sort of things that I really don't want to participate in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a job in London for a month. I was working at a beer factory a month ago when I was in Dunedin. Four days. It was great. <laughs> yeah, you know, do like odd jobs. But you know, you don't really have to do like, you know, every day kind of thing. It's just lucky. You know, you sacrifice things for, uh, you know, other things, which is good. In New Zealand, so just if you're in one city, it's very, you know, the walls start to come in a little bit. So yeah, it's still been fantastic. I love London. Living in London for a while? Yeah, yeah, I absolutely love it there. It's quite hard to express you know, what it's like. It's just so intense, so many people. We've got almost just that whole population of Australia living in this one city, you know. So. It's very dense in every way possible. On a new rave. <laughs> Glow sticks. It's different compared to like America where like you know exactly where the good bands are. In London you really need to kind of look for the, the good bands, you know. There's, it's actually, you know, America kind of prides itself on this like DIY underground punk scene. I kind of think the English, like the scene there is a hell of a lot more underground because you really, 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 really need to look for good bands there, you know? Recording done. In upstate New York with a man named Kevin. We recorded an EP, an EP. for four hours. Good luck, sweets. Like a, and now I'm speaking swell. Hey, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was really cool. It's in a big bar. It sounded interesting. How do you think that compares with the last one? 
Uh, it's got better sounds. We're recording, it sounds a lot better. Yeah, the one before this EP thing with Albini and yeah. the Master Abbey. Yeah. Our album. How was the Albini Chicago experience? Good, but yeah, it was really good. Overrated. Nah, it was cool. No, totally not overrated. It's like, people make these... Well, it's kind of sounded pretty shit. Yeah, but for... <laughs> For no 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 for the thing that people say overrated it's like it's a studio it's an amazing studio and you get to stay there and it's got amazing gear and it's sort of what you do with it yeah exactly rather so, than like it's got this you know it wouldn't mystique. be I wasn't meaning Steve it's sound shit but like you know just that you know it's like how good the band is at the moment yeah exactly. it's not it's not and him he's just pressing buttons he is like, literally just going if the record's gonna sound good there it's because the band was playing well. Can't really polish a turd sometimes. <laughs> Can't really polish a turd. Would he give you suggestions and stuff for, for things if you were trying to get? No, 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 not at all. It's quite funny. I think he sees a lot of uh, young dude band rock guys, shellac, tinge, guitar, boom, boom, boom. Hometown heroes. Every you know he kind of hears a lot. Hears a lot of bands with you know three dudes who want to make a record which sounds like at Action Park, you know. Not that we wanted to do that. Kind of felt he was pretty jaded with the whole rock thing. Well, there's no one really in New Zealand to do it with at the time. We were very excited about going to the idea of going to America, seeing America, going to Chicago and, you know, like, stuff like that. Live up to your expectations? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Internet and file sharing. Well, we're not going to sell a fuckload of, you know, yeah. we're not going to sell millions of records, it's not really enough. I mean, the only people who are complaining about that, really, are bands like Metallica. Who Rich sold. kids of people with, you know, who sell a lot of records. And Music should be easily, you know, accessible. Yeah, we make our, our money from playing live shows, so the more people who know your songs, the more people are going to come to your shows. I think it's sweet ass. I have no problem with that at all. Lucky? Australian Idol. Don't know it. Is it on the um, Don't know it either. No, <laughs> don't even watch that. Does that exist? Yeah, yeah, there is a New Zealand Idol. Yeah, there is a New Zealand Idol, yeah. Did you know New Zealand invented uh, pop stars? Because I was watching Live For Revies today and they said how they sold the you know idea of manufacturing the pop band to America and made billions of dollars, but they, the British actually bought it off the New Zealand band. New Zealand had the first manufactured television pop band called True Loss. Someone was very, very silly <coughs> just never put a little C next to that. Well, no, they, well, they just they sold it for like yeah, easy money. Easy money. Easy didn't, money. Didn't realize it would turn into hundreds of millions. With all the shit that came out of the Fugazi stuff and all of that, like being a band that does the sort of music you do, you feel that you have something that you're supposed to live up to or something. No, or all that, because or? I don't care about America and uh, American punk rock really. It's more just mean about New Zealand punk music for me. Yeah, it's like, you know, like, I love, you know, for garlic, you know, really don't relate to the lifestyles they chose to live at all. Well, like, yeah, it's, you know, but no, but I mean, I'm from a small town in the South Island of New Zealand. It's like, we're totally the opposite of Washington, D.C. It's like, there is nothing in common. Yeah, all. absolutely nothing in common like, with that place <laughs> and that place. You, you can only identify with where you're from, and if you try to be something else, you're going to fail. What's our personal level of success? I'm pretty sweet, eh? <laughs> I'm pretty alright. I'm feeling pretty alright. I'm happy. When I was like 14, I wanted wanted to be in a band. Now I'm in a band. And I wanted to be out of New Zealand. Now I'm out of New Zealand. So maybe I'm alright. Yeah. It's cool. You get to hang out with cool dudes. Cool people. Drink some beers. Play some rocket tunes. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know what I'll be doing in 10 years. I've never, no, 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 I've never ever really thought, hey, this is what I'm going to be doing in two years' time. Hey, I think you're going to, you should quit. I'm kind of like, hey, in two years' time, I'm going to be a rich dude in a big house, you know, but I've just been playing music for so long, you know, it's like, haven't studied, haven't really, you know, just, it's just kind of all I'm done. You know, it'd be pretty easy to kind of settle into a very nice life. But, well, but it depends how nice it's really going to be, you know. Suburban hell would be pretty hellish, you know. 
being young, you know, like we're already, you know, the old Mike is the oldest member of the band. And he's 22. You know, a lot of our friends are like, you know, settled down and got married and had kids that are already at our age, and it's kind of like well, New Zealand. That's a different, it's a different country. I'm glad to be, see, I'm glad to be playing off the benefit because that's the biggest trap yeah, in that, the whole world. That, that is the biggest trap. That's when you the, can't go out, you can't do anything, you just getting by, and that's it. Beating past the five days a week. It's kind of good not being on the dole, like for us anyway. Like you know, you just kind of really pushes you to get out there and do other things instead of sitting at home. It'd be kind of, yeah, just really suffocating. The suffocating heat of this three ton city. No, you know, just, I don't know. <laughs> like, just, you know, just life, you know? It's like, you know, it's just moving, moving, keep on moving. You know, whatever you can say about it, what people say about us, you know, it is, it really is a total life thing. Like, well, how well you're doing, it's what you're doing. Yeah, it's not how well you're doing, it's what you're doing. Wise guy, this guy. Wise guy. Words to live by. <laughs> <laughs> Some killer sex, man. It's like a porno. Anything you guys want to add? Uh, yeah, I think it's pretty much touched it all. It's a good interview. Good interview. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, following through there, the rock messy stuff. rock stuff.
What a waterfall! Wow! Even I saw and the fall and the fall The Tigers of Perth Western Australia started in May 1997. Haven't stopped playing in Perth pretty much every month <laughs> since then. Yeah, I think it's inertia. Yeah. You can't stop. Same lineup for the same time. We've basically been playing with each other since we were about 14, I think. I, I started playing a classical guitar and I told Chris Hudson that he had to learn the bass because I wanted to start a band. And then we got Oliver. And um, I think then we got Chris. And then I wrote a song and I decided I wanted a trumpet on it for this one song. And we got Ben and he put Trump into that one song and just wouldn't go away. <laughs> the first album came out in, to, you know, in early 99, right? Through MDS, which is now defunct. Um, <laughs> and we had a... <clears throat> uh, we outlasted our record company. You know, I think we're all influenced by different people. And depending on, on who's been uh, more influential in creating the song is, is sort of the way that it pans out. Right from the first, the first album we did and the first shows we did, there was such variety of, from one track to the next that um, that sort of hasn't really changed. And so, uh, I mean, it's hard to say that the style has really changed because we never had a consistent style to begin with. Like broad phases, like we started off with songs and then we got into uh, meddling around and improvising for a while. And then now we've gone back to songs. Now we've gone back to songs. Because I can remember going to a show at the Inglewood and it was like some German kraut rock thing you guys were doing. There were, I don't think there were even guitars involved. It was, um, the the Sabretooth Tigers EP, which we did in the time that Ben and Ollie were away, we recorded ourselves. That song, Man, <laughs> Man Friends Man, I don't know, like the band Friends Forever. It's a kind of a, you know, two men in a van doing man things and we're all men and we're doing man things so it was like it was like you know fun play around with gay humor ren and stimpy yeah and also it was because we, we used to have picnics before the rehearsals I remember that. you guys missed out on that we had picnics. yeah we had picnics house that's what I'm <laughs> being in a van is just an excuse to hang out with your guy friends i mean really you should just fucking go and have a picnic with them yeah with your friends the best way... You don't have, it's not emasculating. You don't need to be in a band to have an excuse to hang out with guys that you love. Some people go to other countries <laughs> and shoot people. We've decided to form a band. That's, that's how you forge <laughs> a solid male relationship. Killing and music. Cricket. Cricket. Yeah, we actually all have full full time jobs. Um, I, I held out for a long time. <laughs> yeah. You just got us. This is the Kodak moment that we've been waiting for for quite some time. No, nah, the, the Tigers has um, uh, always been not for personal financial gain. In that, ever since our first show, pretty much we've always banked the money. We've had a, a separate band account and stuff, and which we've enabled us to draw on every time we need to do something. It's helped out with touring in the past. We've had to put out, like shell out ourselves for touring and stuff because it's been too much. But that's, but that's how we survive. We don't have to keep putting our own money into the band. I think we're generally fine with Perth's probably um, um, in the top one or two places to, to be playing. Uh, would you guys agree? Very uh, good looking crowd. Well, yeah, they are. You don't have to pay for the sound engineer and there's actually a PA. And 
Yeah, I, mean, I don't know, I just find it really easy, like easy to make anything happen here. I think, you know, if you're any good, you're not going to have any trouble getting gigs. I don't think people realise how good we've got it here, in a way, like it's really easy just to, to make it all happen. It's probably why we've got so many bands coming out of Perth at the moment. Like everyone's in band in Perth. The last CD came out in 2002 and it's it's kind of cool in a way because we've kind of gone away and come back and even though we've still been playing the whole time, um, there's something maybe different about us now. Maybe starting afresh, like I think the people that we come across now in say the Melbourne scene or whatever don't know about us, don't know the fact that we've been playing for years and years and you know we're just kind of like a new band to them because they're all kind of <clears throat> in their early 20s and, and you know they didn't hear about us when we were sort of around touring overseas. Visas, can you imagine? What a fucking nightmare. Sorry, I sound a bit defeatist here. But I think a lot of the time now, I think we would probably rather just have a holiday than, than tour. Yeah, not enough time, not enough money and too much whinging. I have found with my space that um, there are people out there that are actually quite receptive to that. Some of the groundwork would be done like that. I mean, there was still like, it was still email in 97. It wasn't that long ago. Was it? <laughs> Peter Street had a black background in green tents. I don't think there was internet then, Chris. <laughs> I, remember, I remember conversations. I don't have any problem if people were sharing our stuff on the internet, but I don't think it happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's not cool. If someone says that you can't have something of theirs, then you can't have it. That's what it comes down to. I mean, it, it is illegal. Just because it's easy doesn't mean it's not illegal. I was reading an interview with the dude from um, Songs Ohio or Magnolia Electric Co. and he's actually losing money and he's suffering because of it. And he said in this interview, please don't do it please buy the albums. He said, if I want to hear something, I pay for it. And that's it. So some people, you know, the bigger people, well, you know, I guess there, there shouldn't be any line drawn. It's still intellectual property and it still should be paid for. So, you know, but if you're, if you're happy for it to be free, then that's, that's your business also. Possibly going to be a generation that aren't going to experience the, the sort of thrill of opening up a gatefold vinyl and just having this you know music sort of not only the sort of sound envelop you but also this uh, imagery it smells yeah, good it, yeah it smells good yeah. yeah looks good you pick it up you know you do stuff with it you can say the same things about cds i think cds really ruined the the sort of that element of, of rock and roll as well because the, they're so small and you know because like everything now is about having as much as you fucking can you know having more space on you on your ipod longer itunes list filling up drives and stuff things on shuffle and just having things just passing through your field of vision so expansive that everyone wants to know everything about everything all the time indie rock means this 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 I think that we're one of the few bands who are stupid enough, like not not from an aesthetic point of view, to kind of keep on not getting anywhere, you know, with our music and just keep doing it because we like it and do it, have such a long period where we keep playing the same band whilst not being successful. Most people would either become successful or give up, I think. It's actually just fun to do. Not to undermine it by, by, by saying it's like a hobby, but it is kind of like a hobby. It's expensive. People often assume that there's this weird binary opposition where it's either a band makes it or they fail. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, don't really, know, I don't yeah. really think that's the case. Like, you know, if you if you play music to just make it, then fuck off. You're doing it for the wrong reason. Because I would like to be a rock star. I think that I could spend a lot of time practicing my moves. It's very easy to say how DIY you are when no one's ever given you any money. So I can't say for sure if I really am true. No, I'm not sure I'd take it in this thing. Yeah, take money, yeah. Yeah, okay.
Six songs, and we needed a few more songs. So we all denied that they were about to approach me. We all got together, and it was it was like a dream come true. It was beautiful. <laughs> hey, buddy, we're still here. Dan, where's Dan's at? That's the question. I think. Fucking Dan. Dan's over to the other side of the country. Well, well Ozaki's yeah. still kind of an active thing, but at, at the moment we have one member who's away. You know, Dan comes back every now and again and we play a show or two and... Dan would often bring something in and we'd all kind of stand around and work on it for a, a long time. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure like everything we ever did, he'd kind of go home and sit on the sofa and play guitar and just kind of work out ways to make things yeah, just kind of tell us. crazier and different or... But he'd be too shy to tell us. He would, it'd, it'd take like a month to get the idea out of him. Which is why we are so slow writing songs. He's one of those genius types. Did we ever have any good gigs? 
There was one Not where... Not pause is pretty terrible, because then... Uh, we got called a bunch of junkie fuckheads. It was someone, uh, someone from fuckheads. autopilot. Who actually played 20 minutes or something into a set, to the point where Gang's got the fold back turned off. Oh, and they yeah, still kept, they kept going. On playing. And they're getting the wind up. And um, so we had to play three songs that year. Yeah. And then they um, retired to the crowd upon where they called us a bunch of junkie fuckheads. Yeah, you know, we've never touched drugs in our lives. <laughs> the fuckhead bit might be truth. No, I've never taken heroin. Hey! Hey! This is our friend Matt. <laughs> I'm sure we'll sit now. Struthers! Get your ass in here! Tell us about umpire. We've known, we've known the band was going to be leaving. So he gave us a few months notice. Yeah, okay, so, so to cut a long story short, he wanted to play guitar. And I just wanted to play guitar anymore. I just wanted to sing. And Strut's good at recording stuff. And so that's what that's turned out to be. It's a completely different process. Michael comes in with pretty much a song. Him and I sit around, record the song. We put it on the CD and we slide under Jeff's door. And Jeff's yeah, just literally, we slide on the CD. Jeff's just doing vocals. Every time they bring me, like, a new thing. It's like kind of hearing a song by, like, you know, one of your favourite bands. It's like, oh, you know, what are these guys going on next? That same kind of sense of excitement. I, I don't make a guitar beats and I have no idea what sort of vocal melody you can go over. And then, so you give it to Jeff and, and then he just comes up with something that I just wouldn't have thought of and makes it a totally different sort of song. What are we going to do if Dan and uh, Elsie and Seamus decide to move back to Perth? Well, we've got three more members to the band, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. See, I had this crazy idea that maybe we should do like a broken social scene kind of thing. Because two of the members, you know, moving, you know, have moved or are moving back here. We've got like an unfinished Mugazaki album and we've got this umpire stuff. It'd be like a compilation album. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, kind of. But they're all kind of the same people. I, I got the email through last week about the iTunes store being launched in Australia. I don't know, well, when that sort of stuff wasn't around, when we didn't have sort of digital files and internet and stuff, you'd buy albums and you'd listen to albums from start to finish and you'd, you'd get into albums and you'd find tracks that maybe you wouldn't listen to first off and you'd get to different depths of music and it might, you know, I don't challenge you and you'd kind of listen to stuff differently yeah. and there's definitely records that grow on you. But if you're downloading a song because you like the song instantly, are you really getting that same... Well, last, it? Uh, yes. if, you, if you're a small band and no one knows you outside of your own state, then that's an amazing marketing tool. Yeah. But maybe like when it all comes down to like, forget, forget about packaging, you know, you can download this thing that just projects the fucking band, like, oh, yeah. you know, this hologram thing, life. like, in your room, you know, something like that, then I'll probably go, eh, fuck CDs, let's get this. Yeah, that's cool. What about when you're in your car? Might be a distraction. <laughs> Might be a bit distracting, yeah. But if I pay 70 bucks for a gig, or if I get a free ticket, like, if I've, if I've invested 70 bucks into that gig, I watch the gig so differently to if I just got a free ticket to it. Oh, I don't. So I go to the bar and just drink piss. I, I, I've got records on my iPod that I don't, I don't own. I think I've got some stuff from you. Yeah, and, um, and I've, you don't listen to it. I've yeah. barely given them a listen. Yeah, that, yeah, that's but, true. But yeah, I yeah, buy, yeah, I buy you records. I invest thirty bucks in an album, and I actually get something out of it. You know, yeah. it's like a, you know, you've made a commitment. That's so fucking true. That's really true. From it. For the first time, people just want to be famous for no reason other than just being famous. And you see like a lot of bands with that kind of attitude as well. You know, I mean, we're like sort of the absolute antithesis of that. Like there's no fucking urge to be famous apart from any money that could possibly get me to keep on doing it, to keep on making music. You know, like just being famous somehow makes you a more worthwhile person. That's pretty fucking shit. Famous. Yeah, you do. Well, I mean, shit, I always wanted to be famous when I was a kid because, you know, fucking watch Countdown and want to be in a band. It's like, you know, kind of watching these people on the telly and it's all magical because it's on telly, it's not real life. Mm. But then at the same time, 
you know, you're really being moved by music. You don't know why you're being moved by music. You're just a kid. And so you want to make music and you want to kind of get on the telly and all these kind of things. And as you get older, and so it looks like a pile of shit and you maybe see a little kind of, you know, I mean, we've sort of travelled around a little bit and known people who've been in bigger bands than we are and you just, you know, you see them getting screwed around by record companies maybe and you just they go... They get bigger and then they're not big anymore. Yeah, and you just go, oh, really? That looks kind of shit to me. Amazing fucking feeling you get from making songs and stuff. That doesn't go away. That still stays true. So that seems more substantial well, and real to me than just wanting to be famous. We went to a gig in Sydney, and it wasn't anything to do with, like, we weren't there on tour or anything like that. This chick who I'd never seen before came up, and she goes, um, oh, are you from Okazaki? And she had, like, a badge on her bag. Yeah, that was weird. If that's the tiniest, <laughs> wingiest kind of like example of fame, that's where it's fun because it's funny. If that was happening all the time, that'd be a fucking pain, I reckon. I really enjoyed the time we were going on tour with Adam and Laura when we were at the airport, and these kids came up and obviously thought Matt was the guy from Savage Garden. And these young kids came up and started asking Matt for autographs <laughs> and stuff, and Matt was saying to his parents, so Matt just like, like, signed stuff. Not <laughs> <laughs> his little kids or whatever. His parents were loving it. They're like, "Wow, oh, Matt's really like <laughs> doing stuff, and you know, he's got a special, and people like him. Kids are asking for his autograph and stuff. And maybe that's what we're still doing, you know, hoping for, you know, not, you know, kind of naively hoping for any kind of success like that. But maybe there's a chance that something that we're doing could move someone. Yeah, it could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe. You ready? You ready? Yeah. I don't know, this song's called Corporal Steam.
Thanks a lot. What is the type of bees? It's a man. Approximately his 40s. He wears strange clothes that live with his mother. He's big. He drinks a lot of milk. He gets excited by little things. Bus. Tons on time. But he walks everywhere, that's the thing. He hasn't quite grown up. He doesn't like you. Tucker B is basically just trying to get a fucking leg up. He's trying to get a little bit higher all the time. So he's got to get a little bit. He has short legs. Or short legs. He doesn't have much resources, you know. He has to be resourceful. Tucker B was resourceful. <laughs> he like values plastic bags, corks, the amount. Not corks. 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 Tucker B value a pork as well. Oh, absolutely. Look. <laughs> <laughs> sex. Sex mad. So you say your music's more suited to drunkens or intellects? Here, why don't you have? It's uh, it's. Both, funnily enough, um, drunken intellectuals. Yeah. But that's the thing, a little bit pompous, I guess. Yeah. And all, we consider ourselves to be intellectuals, let's put it that way. Are we elitist? Yes. Ah. Yes. We form our own clubs. <laughs> we, we choose our friends. We chair our own fucking meetings, let's put it that yeah. way. It's like no one driving this bus. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to Sydney, I'm going to live with this man, my brother, my brother Andrew Houston. My brother from a different <laughs> mother. <laughs> We're going to live over there and yeah. then we're going to play shows and stuff and uh, Darren's going to come over. We have to find some new people to get all the stuff done. <laughs> all the stuff done. <laughs> we need like something in our lives. Yeah, something in our lives. That's what we need. It's like the States was. Yeah, that was a concept. We don't actually know what a concept is, but... It's like the States. We as can... a concept, it's amazing. As a concept, it is... <laughs> the United States in America reality, is fucking, fucking mind-blowing. In reality, look, there is, it, you got to have you got to have your blinkers at the fucking ready. At its, yeah. You know what I mean? There's beautiful stuff, there's ugly stuff. Try and avoid the ugly stuff. Do you see yourselves as like, you know, flag wavers for Australia? No. They, the Americans love loved waving the Australian flag for us. It was, yeah. it was, it was charming. They're a charming lot. They, they, we we like to yeah. think of ourselves as not Australian, but of the world. From this fucking world. Hey, what do you boys reckon? Do you think gin is a summery drink? 
is a summary drink. Why do you want to get a summary drink? S U M M E R E Y or S U W M A R A Y. What? Uh, we got ourselves an we intellectual. An insert a little cut. <laughs> Look at him working his TV. Are you a prostitute, mate? Are you a prostitute? You're sweating a bit, mate. Yeah. <laughs> now, there's been a bit of talk over the years, and the, the Tucker B, you know, his concept is fueled by numerous substances and, and, and whatnot. Uh -huh. could, you, could you. Who fucking said that? <laughs> Let's just say we enjoy a good fucking party, okay? But no, not 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 pivotal to creative times. No, just party times. Pivotal to creative can happen living it. Yeah, you can get creative with it, like with indigestion. But really, to have a party, yes, you need to call people and stuff. And, yeah, and you get money out of the ATM, of course. I mean, of course. Drive to different of course, places. Of course, we have to drive. Get in your car. You've drive. got to like, you know, of call, course, call of course. your friends. <laughs> And at any point along that journey, the inspiration can strike. <coughs> so it's not, you know, sort of born of yes, the whole yeah. spectrum. Excuse you wasting time, you can't even no, speak English. Fucking <laughs> moron. <laughs> they haven't ever said what you fucking said. Yes, yes, yes. Hey, Juan. Juan! Do you fucking Juan. speak English there? So, so how long have you guys been playing? Like, since the start? We uh, would say since it's, the start. It's been 10 years, my friend, 10 years. I'm going to be straight years. with you, it's been 10 years. And you guys consider yourself old cunts? Sometimes, but then I don't worry about it. Yeah, because then we pain people, we violence people. Can you fucking, mom, mom? We tend to hang around younger people all the time. We figure if as it, we get older, we have younger friends. In your thirties, it's still cool to be kind of, you know, hanging out. Never young. that you're gonna be like a kiddie fiddler in another ten years. A what? A kiddie fiddler. A kiddie fiddler. Oh. I have worried about that actually. <laughs> My girlfriend said to me the other day, I have the body of an adolescent. <laughs> and I said to her, I love you, babe. <laughs> One thing I want to know is why, why get going? Is it because you haven't finished studying yet? Or, and then you're going to move on to your real life? Or what? It, we keep, I'll tell you why we keep going. For the same reason that every person goes out every weekend. <laughs> Drugs and alcohol, my friend. Drugs and alcohol, <laughs> and we get to sing. No, it's, you know, it's it's basically very fun. Um, it's the thing I think we all enjoy most. To stop being in the band after all these years, in spite of the lack of success that we have achieved, it's it's it would be like giving up alcohol or giving up. Saying, yeah, I want to Giving up methamphetamines or giving up, you know, Heroin. tomato sauce. Heroin, in fact. Are yeah. you ever tempted to write a nice radio friendly song just to, to quicken things, maybe? Quicken things. Absolutely. Uh, we absolutely. are very tempted. And, it, yeah. and, we, we, and we spend most of our time trying. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That's the irony of the thing. We're Coming from Australia, in, in, it's, <laughs> it's nice to have radio friendly songs. But. But things get in the way. Things get in the way. <laughs> I've had diarrhea for like last week. You know what I'm saying? Things like that. Um, you should see one of my fingernails. Here, let, have a look at this one. See how the skin just pulls back from it. You can't run a pop song with I'll tell you what that is, my friend. That's toxic. Toxic. <laughs> see what I'm saying?